All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Borowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time joining us, obviously a huge shout out and a welcome. We're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. On any given month, you can find 40, 50, even 60 live events uh, available for your classrooms to tune into live or catch the recordings afterwards. So head to exploringbytheseat.com. Uh, and you can find what we've got coming up. Biodiversity was our big theme this month, and that's winding down. And next month, uh, we start into some ocean action with World Ocean Day coming up. In fact, today's kind of a good little, a little precursor to some ocean action that we have coming up uh, in June. So we're really excited to be joined by research scientist Helen uh, Gurney-Smith, along with her team at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. They conduct laboratory experiments Use, uh, using predicted climate conditions of warmer waters and lower pH. So ocean acidification, I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into that. So climate change is affecting marine life. It's affecting where they can live, how they respond to changes in their environment. And not only is marine life really cool, as a diver myself, I love getting in the water uh, and spending some time with our ocean life, but they provide us with important food sources and they keep ecosystems, um, economies, and communities kind of running smoothly, especially those on the coast. So I am gonna bring Helen in live with us now. Hey, Helen, how are you? I'm good, hi everyone. Thanks for having me come and talk today. Pleased to be oh. here. Of course, of course, great to have you joining us. Where are you joining us from today? So I'm in St. Andrews in New Brunswick. So just over the border from the US, about 20 minutes away from the US, yeah. All right, very cool. Out in the Maritimes, good stuff. A good spot to be looking at lobsters and other marine life, I have no doubt. Absolutely, yeah. All right, Helen, I'm just going to do a quick shout out to our YouTube community. I can see lots of comments coming in. So use that chat sidebar. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, and then let's keep the chat bar open for questions after that. I don't want to have to mute anybody today. And I will do a quick couple shout outs here. Mr. Smith's grade sevens in Niagara Falls. Great to see you. Fourth graders in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, thanks for joining us. Miss Foster's crew, looks like they're in Niagara as well. We've got Monsieur Powell's grade seven and eights hanging out in London, Ontario. So keep those uh, greetings coming and we will uh, work in some of your questions shortly. But for now, Helen, I'm gonna let you take over. Okay, great. Uh, so again, hi everybody. My name's uh, Dr. Helen Gurney-Smith. So I'm based in St. Andrews in New Brunswick. Um, I came to Canada. You may have detected that I have a little bit of an accent because I'm not originally from Canada, but I came to Canada in 2007. I was actually based over in British Columbia in a university position there. And that's where I kind of started some of my climate change work on marine organisms. And then in 2016, I moved over to New Brunswick to work for the federal government. So kind of doing more of an applied science. Um, so doing science that kind of connects into societal impacts. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about climate change, a little bit about fabulous lobsters, and a little bit about the work that we do on lobsters. All right. So one thing that you may know is that the oceans are changing. So we're getting warmer uh, waters in the oceans. This is causing uh, like the loss of ice sheets glaciers, um, it's reducing the thickness of sea ice up in the Arctic. Um, it's also um, making oceans more acidic, which is ocean acidification, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in a moment. And also there are areas that are losing oxygen. And we're also getting more extreme events which are happening, whether it be like storm surges or whether it be marine heat waves and things like that. And so we know that climate change is already happening. And the work that I do kind of looks at what that means for marine species and those that rely on them. So um, I talked a little bit about ocean acidification. There's this great video from the Alliance for Climate Education that I thought I would share with you because it gives you some more information on uh, what ocean acidification is and what it actually means. So I'll let them tell you the story. Hey, Helen, I'm just noticing the sound's not coming through for us. Um, 
is there a website that I can grab this from and I can pop it up and make sure the sound comes in? Oh, I think I see the YouTube link. Yeah, let me, let me see if I can get us to that link really quick. Can you hear me okay, Helen? Yeah, are you not hearing the sound? Yeah, the sound's not coming through, but I can I can pull that YouTube up on my end and I can uh, I can play it with sound. Okay. Sound can be can be tricky from computer to computer. Sometimes it comes in nice and smooth, and sometimes uh, it doesn't. So I'm just pulling it up now. Okay, I'll just pause it for now. Sorry, everybody, I didn't realize that. No, 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 no worries at all. The fact that it's on YouTube makes it easy to uh, to find and 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 put in there. Oh, can you back up? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Dash D B N K. Okay, got it. I'm gonna oh video unavailable. Uh, that shouldn't be right. Yeah. What's the name of the video? So um if you look for Alliance for Climate Education and Ocean Certification, yeah. You should you should find it there. Oh, you know what? If you look at the YouTube, it's got um, uh, a dot between the U and the B. Oh, I found it here. What is uh, what is ocean acidification? I think that's the right one. That's the one. That's the one. All right. Let's give it a spin. By now you've heard. Oh, yeah. That'll work. By now. Okay. Bear with me for a little share here. Chrome tabs now. There we go. The way we're living is filling up our atmosphere with carbon dioxide. As a result, the planet's warming. Heat waves and floods are more likely to be extreme, and people's lives will get tougher. And the more we learn about climate change, the more risks we uncover. Since we started burning fossil fuels, the ocean has absorbed about half of all the CO2 we humans have put out. That's why it's called the planet's biggest carbon sink. Now this is good because it's kept a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. But as the ocean warms, it takes up less and less CO2. And with all that CO2 in the sea, scientists are shedding light on, well, an ocean of problems. Ready for the first big problem? Some sea creatures like clams, oysters, and coral, their shells and skeletons are getting weaker. Okay, you've got bigger problems than easy to crack clams? Maybe not if you're among the one in seven people who get most of their protein from seafood or if you understand how unstable the world would be with a billion more hungry people. What's weakening the shells? Well, these little creatures are going about their lives scooping up molecules called carbonate ions to be the building blocks of their shells. But when CO2 reacts with seawater, it releases hydrogen ions, which compete with shells for carbonate. With more hydrogen ions floating around in the ocean, our little friends have to spend more energy building their shells and have less energy for finding food. That means it's harder to grow and more will die off before they get big. So the fish that eat the clams or live among the coral will have a harder time surviving, meaning the fish that dine on them won't have enough to eat. And so we won't have enough to eat. Remember those pesky hydrogen ions generated by more CO2? They don't just take away the carbonate ions that these little clams need. They also make the ocean more acidic. It's already become 30% more acidic since we started spewing all this CO2, and it could get much worse. We could change the ocean's chemistry so much that shells actually start to dissolve. That means if we don't turn this problem around, your great grandkids might think of reefs the way you think of a dodo bird. And with one in four ocean species living in coral reef ecosystems, weaker coral could threaten the foundation of the whole ocean food chain. But why panic, right? Life always seems to find a way to adapt, but it needs time. In a few decades, we might make the oceans more acidic than they've been in 20 million years. It's hard to imagine any ecosystem quickly adapting to that big of a change. But things don't have to get that bad. We've started this problem and we're going to fix it, beginning at its source, carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. Learn more at aspace.org. Thanks for facilitating that, Joe. No problem. Yeah. So, um, uh, am I back to sharing again? Yep. You're loaded up. 
Virginia. Okay. Great. So sorry about that, everyone. It worked perfectly fine on my computer, but there you go. Uh, must be a streaming thing. Anyway, so um, we know from that video that uh, there's a global impact that's happening of ocean acidification and so this reduced pH in oceans. There's a lot of different things that can happen regionally that can actually make um, um, ocean acidification occur either faster or through seasonal processes. So, for example, up in the Arctic, when the sea ice melts because there's um, an increased, uh, increased global warming, what happens is that the um, CO2 is more readily taken up into cold waters. So it means that the Arctic is, um, their pH is going down faster than other regions. Um, in the Atlantic uh, Labrador system, you have this deep mixing, which actually also takes up a whole load of CO2. And then in the Pacific, you have these seasonal oceanographic cycles, which um, uh, can lead to upwelling, which is where uh, deep, um, CO2, like carbon dioxide rich water, is actually pulled into the near shore and so can affect pH levels again. So there's some more information that you can find um, down at the uh, YouTube um, link as well. So um, we know that there's all these different factors, you know, like temperature, ocean acidification, low oxygen salinity, things like that, which are changing related to climate change and other processes like biological things, like whether there's enough phytoplankton or zooplankton or changing in like the life cycle of when animals may reproduce or not. Um, so the work that we do is kind of looks at how species are changing with climate change and whether they're going to be more vulnerable and what the potential that they have for adaptation. And then all the information that uh, we generate then goes uh, to other people within fisheries and oceans uh, sciences who do the kind of marine resource planning. And ultimately that has the, the goal or the aim of um, supporting communities, ecosystems, and economy uh, for kind of healthy, productive lives for all Canadians. So um, I just thought I would also share a video. Fingers crossed that this one works. I'm just going to turn off the music there uh, because some of you may be really, really familiar with lobster and other people may not know lobster at all. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this kind of amazing creature. Um, so they're arthropods, so they're in the insect family, and they have an external skeleton or an exoskeleton, which is their hard shell. Um, but uh, some of the facts that you may not know about lobster are that they can actually live a very long time. So uh, they know that they can live at least 40 years, although some scientists think that they, they can um, live a lot longer. They, they can be aggressive and territorial, as you're seeing here. A market size lobster is about five to seven years old. And to get to that stage, it will have to have molted, which is where the external um, shell comes off. And then it's grown a new shell underneath. It'll have to do that 25 times before it gets to market size. They actually chew their food with their stomach. Um, and you may know that uh, lobsters, there's uh, different colors of lobster that you may see. So you might see blue ones or yellow or orange or white or even like two-tone ones. And that can happen through um, genetic mutation. They have very complex social dynamics and they can actually recognize lobsters they've met before. Um, and they can communicate with each other using their urine as well. Um, the way they escape from predators is that they swim backwards with their very strong tail kind of flapping and they'll eat almost anything. So crabs, shrimp, snails and even other lobsters. So they are cannibalistic. They've got two different types of claws. So they've got a pincher claw and a crusher claw. And some lobsters have a crusher claw on the left and some on the right. So just like humans, you can have left handed and right handed lobsters or left clawed and right clawed lobsters, I guess I should say. Uh, they have different chemical receptors, which are on their feet. Um, when the female produces the eggs, she carries them on her stomach, on her abdomen, and um, she'll carry them from, for up to 11 months at a time before they hatch. They're more active at night than during the daytime, and baby lobsters are actually released into the water column, and they can travel for uh, 100 kilometers, uh, drifting on currents before they actually settle um, on the seafloor. Once they've molted, they'll actually eat their own shells. So they kind of eat their skins, so to speak, uh, to replace some of the calcium that they've lost from, um, um, from molting that shell. And their, uh, their blood is called hemolymph and it's actually clear. And when it comes out into the water, say a lobster breaks a leg, um, what happens is it coagulates really, really quickly. So it means that the lobsters don't actually um, bleed to death. 
And unfortunately for lobster, a lot of people think that they taste delicious with garlic butter. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about lobsters, I'll talk to you about some of the experimentation that we're doing um, uh, in the St. Andrews Biological Station uh, in New Brunswick. So some of the things that we do is we, you know, look at these different climate stresses. So, you know, what does ocean acidification mean to adult and embryo lobsters? What does temperature mean? Um, how does reduced food lobsters? Because like in that video, you know, you see that there's projected uh, declines in some kind of marine species. And uh, so that has a knock-on effect, not just for us as eating them, but also for other marine animals who are eating them as well. So the experiment I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is a two-year experiment. Uh, so it takes a lot of time to do those kind of experimentations. And it's what we call a multiple stressor experiment. So it means we're taking multiple climate or environmental stressors, and we're looking at different combinations of them all at the same time. And then we see um, what that means for the marine species that we study. So this looks like a very nice flat kind of experimental design, uh, but the reality is more like this, where there's like huge amounts of tanks and animals and replication and tubes and everything like that. So it takes, and controllers, so it takes a lot to run these kind of experiments and it also takes a, a really dedicated uh, team of people to be able to do that. So some of the things that we look at is we look at the lobster embryos. So, uh, for example, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the top left hand picture, you see these little, little embryos. You can see little dark eye dots. Um, so these are the embryos when they're in the abdomen of the mother. In the picture in the top right, you can see some of the metrics that we use. So we take different um, um, samples of the A is the size, the B is the yolk, and the C is like the whole body shape. And we look at, we use that for looking at developmental rates over time. So it's really important for fisheries management to be able to estimate uh, when they're gonna hatch and how long they're gonna hatch for. Um, and that fee feeds into kind of um, survival indices for fisheries modeling. So you can see some um, mid-development embryos on the bottom left. And then over on the right, you can see the slightly different, um, you can see some kind of structures inside. And that's the larvae when they're just about to be uh, released. So um, another really important metric for the work that we do for fisheries and oceans is about lobster clutch. We call it clutch, but it's um, the amount of eggs that a female lobster will produce. So over on the right hand side, you can see there um, a female that has a lot of eggs. This is what we consider to be a healthy clutch whereas the female on the left only has a few eggs. So that's considered like an abnormal clutch. So when we're looking at those metrics in association with climate science is that we're trying to see how many lobsters might be available for the population in the future. Because generally you think of like the more eggs, the more um, lobsters that are going to come out of it. So another thing that we did look at was um, shell disease. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see a very healthy lobster. Um, he seems to have broken out of some of his bands. He's that healthy. And then over on the right hand side, you can see at the kind of top of the head, you can see some pitting. And that's what you see um, in close up on the on the middle picture. And so what we're looking at there is to see whether um, climate will mean more disease for lobsters, which will also um, um, affect populations as well. And also another thing that we looked at is uh, lobster behavior to see if they would behave any differently with climate. So the slide that you're seeing here is some of the lobster larvae from our, our experiment. In the bottom left-hand corner, you might see little white dots and those are light reflecting from the little lobster eyes. In the top left-hand side, you see a kind of deformed looking larvae there. Um, so that's just hatched out that's not going to make it to be a functional lobster. It has too many kind of um, uh, physiological deformities. And on the right-hand side, top right-hand side, you see a very healthy uh, lobster larvae that's just hatched. So um, we're seeing whether climate will actually affect um, overall survival of lobsters. And on the bottom right-hand side, you can see um, a little juvenile lobster there. Uh, she was very cutely named Lavender. Um, but Lavender was hugely cannibalistic and actually ate all of her brothers and sisters that were in the tank with her. So she was very aggressive. 
So some of the things that we've found out so far is we've kind of looked at these individual factors of warming water, reduced diet and um, decreased pH. And then we've looked at the intersection of those as well. And so we found that with warming water, that led to earlier spawning and hatching. So what that means is that the lobster larvae will be in the water earlier. And does that mean that there's food available for them to be eating when they actually hatch out? Um, we found with the females, the adults, that actually increased their aggression levels. So, um, I mean, just like us, when we get too hot, we don't like it particularly, they don't like it either. And it also increased the amount of shell disease that we had. When we looked at decreased pH, so ocean acidification on its own, we found that it reduced the number of eggs that the females produced. It also reduced the hatching success of the larvae coming out of those eggs. And it also decreased survival of the, um, uh, the larvae overall as well. When we look at reduced diet on its own, um, that increased aggression too. They were very hangry, hangry lobsters. Um, and it also delayed the embryo development as well. It meant that the, um, the females, when they actually did go to molt, uh, they weren't very successful in doing that. And also um, there was very poor organ quality. So um, some of the interactions between things, so like warming water and reduced diet really increased the aggression levels that we saw and led to really poor body condition. Um, when you had the interaction of decreased pH and reduced diet, this affected molting success and also um, increased mortality after they had molted. And then with uh, warming waters and decreased pH, we saw a difference in the levels of uh, shell disease that we saw. So some of the other things that we're doing is that we're looking at, we're using different molecular tools. So you may have heard of uh, gene expression um, or epigenetics potentially, but these tools basically help us to see whether stress can get inherited from a mother to their offspring. Um, and um, it can tell you like first level of reactions of organisms, like how they may be coping with the stress that they're experiencing in their natural environment. So um, this is really like the first in a big series of experimentation that we hope to do because there's so many different factors and there's so many different climate scenarios, uh, but it definitely gives us some really useful information that we can use for um, working out what climate change will mean uh, for lobsters. So like I said, it takes a whole team of people, some of the people are on the list here. Um, and if you want to learn more about ocean acidification, there is actually an ocean acidification community of practice that it would be great if you wanted to join. It's everyone from like scientists to governance to industry people to citizen science to anyone who wants to learn. So uh, we'd be really happy to have you join us and find out more information at the website. I don't know if you have any questions about lobsters. All right, Helen, thank you so much. That second video played just great um and that was a lot of fast lobster facts they're they're pretty cool oh. we don't really think of them very much uh other than maybe you know most of us just walking through the grocery store and you see that tank of lobsters i don't think we think about how cool they really are and, and all the the neat adaptations they have to survive yeah i mean i've uh i've got a bit attached to them i used to eat lobster i can't eat them anymore <laughs> Fair enough. You do spend a lot of time with them. So, uh, yeah. and I, I think I heard some names for some of them. So I would see, I would think it would be hard uh, to work <laughs> the same way again after that. Very yeah. cool. Well, before we start meeting some of our classrooms, so those who are tuning in online, feel free to put some questions in um, uh, via the chat. If you have any questions about how climate change is changing the ocean or lobsters in general, or or, or the research that Helen is doing, and we're gonna meet some of the live classrooms as well. But I'm curious, has the, the work you've been doing gone on long enough to kind of give you an idea of, you know, you're seeing the changes when you, you change the water. How, do you, do you have a rough idea of how long before we start seeing that naturally, before we start seeing that in the oceans, if we don't, uh, yeah, we don't start changing so, the practices? Yeah, so the scenarios that we use, like the different levels are based on climate projections. So they come from like um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a big source of um, information like climate global modeling information. So, um, and then there are downscaled models. So it means that, you know, you take the global 
change in pH, and then you see what it's actually going to mean for your region. And then that's what we apply to our um, to our kind of stressor level. So we're trying to get something which is like either you know under a specific climate scenario and a specific time frame. All right. So it's it's definitely not, you know, you're not doing far out kind of things. This is, you know, looking at the way things are going. We see this is where things are heading. So, um, you know, they're not kind of pie in the sky scenarios. This, you know, you're getting a real good picture of where we're headed. Yeah. And, and you know, as climate projections become, uh, we have more information that feeds into them when we've seen more of a change and we can kind of work out what the rate is better. It means you can do more accurate projections. But, you know, lobs are really interesting because they have this larval cycle where, you know, the embryo, uh, the embryos hatch and the little larvae are just kind of released into the water column and they get drifted about here, there and everywhere. So they um, they experience a lot of variation because they're up in the surface waters of the ocean. And then yeah. when they become like the, the benthic lobster, so the lobster that lives on the seafloor that we all kind of know as a lobster, um, they then experience very different conditions. So uh, there's a lot of knowledge gaps out there. Um, it's definitely improving um, for the kind of different layers of information that we need to make really, really accurate projections. But yeah. every time we do one of these studies, it helps for sure. Okay. Yeah. That picture was really cool at the beginning. You wouldn't, you wouldn't look at that and be like, yeah, that's a lobster. When you look at that little, that little yeah, larva that you had at the, at the beginning, they go through a lot of changes uh, before yeah. we see what we see. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Course class, they are joining us. I see that they're sharing their screen. So we'll get a look at everybody joining us from home. Hey everyone. How are we doing? Hi everybody. Shall I stop sharing oh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I took it out anyways, but yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, the, I see you already typed a question or two in the chat, but let's get one of those live. Yeah, Jasnur, go ahead, please. And after that, Muskan, quickly ask a question. Thank you. Can lobsters live without water? So uh, they can live without water for, um, you know, a period of time. Like you may have even been on an aeroplane and seen somebody with lobsters in a box that they're taking somewhere else. So they, they can live for a certain period of time, but it's not very good for them. And it's definitely not what makes them happy. So sometimes you'll even hear the lobster in the box make a weird kind of noise. Um, and that's probably because he's not very happy where he is. So, yeah, lobsters in the sea. That's where they should be. All right. What's the second question? Go ahead. Muskan, go ahead, please. Can lobsters hurt people? So lobsters, um, you know, when you think about them, they have these great big claws at the front, and they also have little claws which are on their um, other smaller legs. Um, and that's so that they can grab food, and it's also so they can defend themselves. Like you probably saw in that video, that lobster, he was like trying to get into a little hide, and he was like pulling algae around him so that he could defend himself. Well, um, you know, lobsters definitely, if you get one of those crusher claws that pinches on you, yeah, it hurts. It does hurt. I mean, they're not going to jump up at you and try and go for your neck or anything like that. But if you put your fingers close enough to those claws, uh, you'll definitely get nipped. And pretty much everyone in my group, unfortunately, has been nipped by a lobster. It's a little bit of an experimental hazard that comes with the job. Great question. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Great questions from our crew. And good to see everybody virtually. Uh, okay, let us see. Mr. Shaddix crew is joining us from Chalk River, Ontario, and looks like we can get a look at them as well. How are we doing, everyone? Doing well. Hopefully, Olivia will be able to uh, be heard here for her question. All right. Uh, I have two. One of them is how do you tell how old the lobsters are? And another one is how many different species of lobsters are there? Okay, so for the first one is, it's really, we kind of use metrics which are based on size. So we have to work out because they keep molting and every time that they molt, they get a little bit bigger. Um, so it's not like, uh, for example, like shellfish, like clams, where you can cut a section of the shell and you look like tree growth rings. So you can see it like that. You can't really see that on a lobster, but it's related to size generally, yeah. 
And then your second question, which was the number of species of lobster, that's a really good question. And I'm afraid I do not know that because they have a load of Caribbean species. There's tropical lobsters. There's even these ones that they call lobster, but they're not actually lobster. They're like fake lobsters. Um, so that, that's something I'm going to have to find out. I'll have to Google that. Yeah, absolutely. I have a feeling that, you know, as we continue exploring the ocean more, that we might just discover a few more species. Uh, anyways, I think there's lots of things in the ocean that we don't know 100% how many there are or how many different species there are. That's for sure, yeah. Okay, uh, let's grab, actually, let's do a quick YouTube run. Let's go, grab a few questions from YouTube. There's lots of questions coming in here. So let's start off with... Um, Okay, so uh, the first one here is from Angie, and they're curious, normally, uh, without any uh, changes, how, how many eggs would you expect a lobster to produce at, at any given time? Yeah, so it's normally thousands. Yeah. So it would be, it depends on the mother as to how many eggs she actually produces, but like a normal clutch would be in the thousands, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing it's kind of like a sea turtle scenario where lots of eggs, but few make it um, to maturity. Yeah, exactly. So for most um, invertebrate animals, they their uh, reproductive strategy is normally that they have like a lot of offspring and they estimate that there's very poor survival that comes out of it. All right. Penelope from our class in Tucson, Arizona, I uh, would like to know, can you tell us about some more of the equipment? Uh, that you need to set up uh, you know we oh, saw the picture of some of the equipment can you tell us about a little bit more of the equipment really really great question so um you can imagine like a whole series of tanks so um you've got seawater coming in and seawater running out and inside each one of those tanks we have a probe so it's like a um uh you know like a kind of cylindrical tube and inside it sends information from the probe along a wire back into a controller system where it actually logs um, what that pH value is. And then that is connected to a valve, which is connected to a carbon dioxide cylinder. And um, when we're trying to hit certain pHs, we're programmed into the, uh, into the controller unit. And then that valve on the CO2 will open up and it will inject air, well, CO2 back into the tank and it will reduce the pH to the level that we want to get for our future scenarios. So it's like a con continuous looping system and it records all of the information so that we can see how the system is working. And then every week we do a thing which is called calibrating the system. So we basically check that the system is working properly and efficiently. Yeah, but it's, it's a lot. You gotta keep your eye on everything, yeah. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I'm sure there's times where uh, you know, technology didn't quite cooperate. You may have lost some data or kind of had to restart everything. I'm sure that's it's happened. Normally, it's normally Friday afternoons oh, uh, good. when animals decide to spawn or uh, machinery decides to become faulty. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, let's bring in another classroom here. Ms. Kozub's grade five sixes are joining us. How are you doing today, Ms. Kozub? Hi, we're doing good. Thank you. I'm not sure if uh, you can hear me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you're coming in nice and clear. Okay, perfect. So I actually, um, I'm just going to invite Logan to unmute and ask his question. Um, so why do lobsters have different claws? Why not the oh. same? So you mean like a pincher and a crusher? Yeah, so um, why aren't they both pinchers or why aren't they both crushers? Yeah, so a pincher is better for kind of like uh, grabbing food and then moving it to the mouth. Um, whereas the crusher is the great big like heavy hand, which is like, argh, you know, kind of protecting itself if it wants. So if it had two pinches, it might be able to eat um, more dexterously. Um, but if it, you know, it wouldn't be as good in a fight. Um, whereas if it had two great big crushes, then uh, presumably it'd be knock, knocking other lobsters out left and right, but wouldn't be as good for um, feeding. All right, you need that balance. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. Well, while we're here, is there another question from the five sixes? No pressure, I can come back in a minute. 
Uh, I have another one. Great, Logan, go ahead. <laughs> um, what are their antenna for? So their antenna, they have two different sets, actually. They have the really big antenna, which they can use for, like, kind of feeling things. And then they have these things called antennules, which just kind of, like, flick around. And those are, like, kind of sensory ones. And um, in one of the facts I told you that they communicate through urine, so they'll actually we at each other. And then those antennules will kind of pick up chemical receptors you know, chemical signals. Uh, and, and you'll see like very specific, like flicking behaviors when they're kind of sensing something's going on. Um, so they use Wow. Them. Yeah. All right. So I'm, I'm glad I'm that so humans can communicate that way. <laughs> what was that like? Okay. Very cool. I love the lobsters already. <laughs> I know. They're amazing. Yes. Very, very cool. cool. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. <laughs> Uh, let's jump back to YouTube for a couple more questions. Um, yeah, very neat. There's, you know, you hear about some animals having different senses uh, than we do, but that's one that maybe I could do without. Some of the other ones are pretty cool, <laughs> echolocation and stuff. That one, eh, not as exciting. Uh, okay, uh, let's go back to the comments here. Um, so, uh we'll we'll put in two here the first one uh is taylor's wondering if climate change is affecting animals like lobster do, do, would any of those effects be passed on to us if, if we consume them so um no no so um you know climate change can affect things you know there's going to be some species that probably do better in future scenarios and some species that do worse and some species that probably don't do very well at all and may not be around in certain regions uh, under certain scenarios. But uh, climate change doesn't really affect anything that can be passed on to you. There has been some studies that have said that with uh, warming waters, it may affect the size of fish, but mm. it shouldn't affect like the nutritional um, benefits of seafood or anything like that. All right. So Mr. Powell's class is tuning in and they're wondering, with the rate that we've already changed, um, you know, the levels of uh, of carbon in the ocean and, and the, um, the acid level has changed, the pH level has changed. Could we, is it, would it be a quick process to, to undo or would it be a long period of time of, of less kind of emissions before we see a change? Well, there has been an IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. It was the 1.5 special report um, on um, increased waters. And so, um, you know, any change is good. Um, the change, the change, I mean, as in like the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, what is happening is that we are at this accelerated rate, but there are things that we can do to slow that rate. Um, as to whether things will go back to the way they are before, I think that some things are probably irreversible, um, but definitely there are things that we can do to reduce the rate of warming. So um, with the reduction in rate of warming, that means that the ice caps won't uh, melt as quickly, glaciers won't melt as quickly, so you're not going to have that um, cold water coming into the oceans, which then absorbs more CO2, becomes more acidic. It's not going to change current patterns as much. Um, and it will mean that organisms have um, a longer period of time to um, uh, change. Yeah, so yeah. We definitely can do something. Everybody can do their bit. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, let's take a quick, I think we can get through uh, one more quick visit to the camera crew. Uh, let's bring in Mrs. Kursko group again. I can see that they had another question. Oh, Thank let me bring in the kids too. There we go. Uh, Kagan, you had a question and after the presentation you go. Thank you. Is there a lobster in the world? Sorry, what was that, Donna? Okay. Is there the oldest lobster in the world? The oldest lobster in the world? So. Really, the American lobster is the one that I know the most about. So that is the one that we know can get up to 40 years. And we think that there is going to, um, that it will be longer 
potentially than that. Um, normally, what it is is that you have to have, um, you know, like an aquarium, for, for example, that's kind of holding lobster for a long period of time so that we can see what their total age can be. Um, but yeah, 40 years is, I think, pretty long for a marine insect. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> can, are the monsters or like the real monsters and where can you find them? Are you asking where can where can we usually find the lobsters? Yeah, where can we find them and are they like the real monsters? So you can uh, find the lobsters that I'm talking about is the American lobster. So you can find them all over the Atlantic uh, regions of Canada and also um, the U.S. as well. So you can find them from kind of uh, Rhode Island upwards. Yeah. Oh, all I right. do find them in Finland, but not as much. There's lots of them currently in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So just to build on that, where do you get yours yours from for the studies? Are they, um, does your team they're go out or do you purchase them? They're local. So we get them directly from um, local fishermen. So we try and get Bay of Fundy populations, but we are yeah. hoping to do some future studies that look at um, different populations along the coast and to see if some of them have better climate uh, adaptation capacity than others. Okay. Mr. Shaddix Crew, do you have a follow up? Yes, hopefully Charlotte will be able to ask hers if you can pop her class screen up. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So Charlotte, if you can hear me, you can go ahead. Hi, I'd like to know if will lobster eat another lobster for nutrients if it can't find any other food? Yes, yeah, so they are cannibalistic, so um, they will um, munch on like other uh, crustaceans like them, so that they eat crabs and shrimp, which are kind of like cousin species, um, but they will also eat other lobsters too, and certainly in our study, it was one of the problems that we had, was that uh, brothers and sisters even would eat each other, and that's how we ended up with lavender, the one lobster that ate all of its siblings and became very big very quickly <laughs> all right nature can be a tough place sometimes it's not uh not all fun and games fair enough all right um our grade five sixes do we have another question i'll just check in quickly sorry we don't have a question we just we have to run so we wanted okay. to thank you <laughs> okay. yeah yeah no worries at all thanks for joining us today thank you so I'm going to grab one more, Helen, from, from YouTube, and then we'll wrap up for today. And I think this is a great one, uh, especially for our classes surrounding the Great Lakes. They're wondering if some of the impacts of ocean acidification, if that same thing is happening in the Great Lakes, are, are they becoming more uh, acidic? Um, so the Great Lakes, yeah, I mean, it's a really sadly, it's an understudied area for ocean acidification. So there is um, a big group that I'm part of, which is a collaboration between the federal scientists in Canada and the federal scientists in the US. And we are trying to get more information on what's happening in the Great Lakes and to see whether there's issues there. But that's a really great question. And it definitely is an area that needs to be studied more. All right, so stay tuned. And I think I always like bringing this point up is that there are so many amazing careers in uh, exploring our ocean and studying our ocean, learning more about our ocean. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a scientist to still get out on ocean ships. Uh, we need everybody from engineers to crew members to even the cooks uh, on the ship so you can still play a role uh, in ocean exploration. And we have uh, so much left to discover, I'm sure. Um, Helen, you can relate. You go out with 10 questions and come back with 100 more. So um, lots of great careers in ocean exploration, science, research um, to be found. Absolutely. And there's a whole load of careers which are kind of related, which are like using new molecular tools, for example. So that's a different kind of discipline application to, like you say, the engineers, the boat drivers, the, the technical help, the people on the microscopes. The, yeah. It, you know, a lot of these questions are really big and complex, and now we have the power in science. That's why a lot of these teams are really multidisciplinary to answer the questions. So I work right. with some really cool people. 
Very cool. Well, I want to give a shout out to the crew on YouTube today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sending in so many great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. Uh, and then a shout out to our camera classrooms. Great to have our classrooms joining us uh, and sharing your questions live. Always great to get a sneak peek at everybody joining uh, from home. So obviously, Helen, a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing um, your research with us and, and helping us get to know our, our friend, the lobster, a little better. You're very welcome. Anytime. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to sign off for today.